This episode is brought to you by Helix Sleep, GQ and Wired's number one mattress of 2020. I'm obsessed with these. They have the best mattress I've slept on and not just by a little bit. It's better than any mattress by a lot. It's like sleeping on a cloud. No topper necessary, obviously. I cannot tell you how much I love these guys. There's more too. They have a very long warranty. You don't have to go to a store to get them. Is there anything worse than lying on what's essentially a public mattress? Honestly, there are many things that are worse than that. But still, with Helix, finding the perfect mattress is super easy. Just take the quiz at helixsleep.com slash Jordan. Order the bed you're matched to, and it'll be shipped right to your door for free. They all come with a 10-year warranty, and you can try it for 100 days risk-free. They'll even pick it up if you don't love it. The Helix quiz matches your body type and sleep preferences, so you can easily find the perfect mattress for you. I took the Helix quiz and was matched with the Helix Midnight. Right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash Jordan. Take their two-minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a customized mattress for the best sleep of your life. That's helixsleep.com slash Jordan for $200 off and two free pillows. Welcome to the Jordan B. Peterson podcast, season four, episode 56. This episode was recorded on October 18th, 2021. Mustafa Akiol joined dad to discuss Islam as a whole. They talked about the different roles Jesus and Mary play in Islam and Christianity, about the dangers of literal readings of religious texts, and the separation of church and state, just to name a few things. Mustafa is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, where he focuses on the intersection of public policy, Islam, and modernity. He's been an opinion writer for the New York Times since 2013, where he covers po politics and religion in the Muslim world. His 2011 book, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, was long listed for the Lionel Gelber Prize. It offers a strong case for Islamic liberalism that's also been praised by the Financial Times, calling it an elegant Muslim defense of freedom. His other books include Reopening Muslim Minds and the Islamic Jesus. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased today to have as my guest, Mustafa Akul. He is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, where he focuses on the intersection between public policy, Islam, and modernity. Since 2013, he's also been a frequent opinion writer for the New York Times, covering politics and religion in the Muslim world. He's the author of several books, including the most recent, Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return, to Reason, Freedom, and Tolerance, 2021. Why I, as a Muslim, sorry, why, as a Muslim, I defend liberty, which is also 2021. The Islamic Jesus, how the king of the Jews became a prophet of the Muslims, 2017. And Islam without extremes, a Muslim case for liberty, liberty 2011. His books have been translated into many languages and praised in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the Chicago Tribune, The Economist, The Financial Times, and many publications across the Muslim world. Meanwhile, Islam Without Extremes was banned in Malaysia for challenging the authority of the religion police, so to speak. The Thinking Muslim, a popular podcast, recently defined Akyal as probably the most notable Muslim modernist and reformer. So that's really something. And in July 2021, Prospect magazine in the UK listed him among the world's top 50 thinkers. And that's quite the pinnacle. He's been thinking about the problems of making peace in the modern world for a very long time and stressing the need for a liberalization in the Islamic world and perhaps some modification on the Christian side as well, along the lines at least of what happened in the West. He's interested in theological questions as well as political questions, and I'm particularly interested in talking to him because the conflict between Islam and the Jewish and the Christian worlds is a theological and political problem as well as a psychological problem. So. Welcome. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation, and I hope I have many more of the same with many Islamic thinkers. So thanks for agreeing to talk to me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Peterson. It's a pleasure and a privilege to have this conversation with you. And I hope this should be the beginning of uh, broader conversations between Muslims and uh, Western intellectuals on the crucial issues of peace, coexistence, freedom, toleration that we all need to have and need to cultivate in our uh, respective traditions. So let me start with a 
a really difficult issue that I've been thinking a lot about lately, partly because of the, well, some of the, hmm, what would you say, incomprehensible goings on that bedevil the Western world at the moment. Now, I've been thinking a lot about a statement in the New Testament about rendering unto God what is God's and unto Caesar what is Caesar's. The idea that there's a clear distinction between those two, and I believe that to be true for psychological reasons as well as political reasons. And it's an extraordinarily notable statement in my estimation. Um, I don't know if you could find a single sentence that anyone has ever said that has had a bigger impact on the history of the world, because it, as I understand it, that statement was the justification for the development in the West of political processes that were independent of the theological substructure beneath them. And the justification for that, that there were separate mm -hmm. domains and that was okay theologically. And so I want to know if that's your understanding of the situation as well. And then we can talk about what that means for, for Islam, where I, I understand that it's not so obvious, let's say, that such a distinction can be easily drawn. Uh, I would totally agree with you that separation of church and state in the Western tradition has been a blessing for humanity. I mean, West itself and the broader, I think, human story. And I think that's evident in the fact that a lot of Muslims around the world today who are persecuted in their countries come to live in the West and where they find freedom. And if it was a Christian theocracy, you know, they wouldn't be happily living there. Uh, I mean, I, a few times I said that, I mean, there is one country in which all denominations of Islam happily live together without any sectarian persecution, and that is the United States of America. And I'm sure Canada is doing pretty well, or uh, UK. Yeah, pretty well. Um, uh, one thing, I mean, some, of course, some models of separation of religion and state sometimes went illiberal towards religion, authoritarian towards religion, and that's a problem. For example, I see that in the French laïcité tradition. Mm -hmm. And and when uh, secularism is understood in that sort of intolerant way and somehow a bias towards religion, actually it becomes harder to accept from a religious point of view. And one problem in the Islamic tradition is that we always had the French version in my country, Turkey, and in Tunisia. So we never got a full sense of a uh, a liberal, classically liberal uh, idea of secularism. But I mean, that's the political story. I mean, we can discuss more. But coming back to your uh, point, it is remarkable that actually a statement from uh, Jesus Christ, you know, right there in the New Testament has been discovered and used to justify the suppression church and state. I mean, the very life story of Christ is uh, interesting. I mean, he was never the state, right? He was, he was actually persecuted by the state. So there's a great story there. But I will also remind you one thing. For centuries, Christians didn't understand the render on to Caesar and render on to God as the justification of secularism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, actually, it was used to justify divine rights of kings as well. I mean, Robert uh, Filmer makes that argument in his Patriarcha, and John Locke argues against him. So it was used by Christians to uh, to def defend divine, divine rights of kings, but then other Christians said, hey, no, 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 there's a better understanding of this. It actually says there are separate authorities here. And the one that the, the divine authority is what we're loyal to. And the political one should be based on contract. So that gave us, of course, the liberal tradition that I highly value. But I will say a similar process of rereading the scripture is taking place in the Muslim world in the past few centuries, past two centuries, in the late 19th century. A tradition broadly called Islamic modernism, which I, you know, hope to represent and I'm trying to advance, also said well, there are messages in the Quran that our classical scholars maybe didn't fully get or didn't fully develop because in their time and context, it wasn't possible. But now we see the full meaning of that. For example, one example is a powerful statement in the Quran, which reads, la ikraha fi din, uh, in Arabic, which means there is no compulsion in religion. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it doesn't say secular state, but it means religion should be based on no compulsion, in other words, freedom. And this was there in the Quran for centuries. And Muslims made only a little sense of this. They said, okay, this means you will not convert people to enter Islam. Generally, that was observed in the classical Islamic tradition. That's why Jews and Christians could live under Islam. But they didn't understand it in other ways. For example, this should mean that perhaps if people want to convert out of Islam, that is apostasy. It should be free too, based on this verse. But no, 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 they said, you know, actually, it doesn't mean that way. So they limited the meaning of the verse. And of course, there was religious policing, checking people are really pious or not, or persecution of heretics. These things happened in Islamic history. But now other Muslim thinkers are saying, listen, uh, 
When God said there is no compulsion in religion, it's a universal statement of no compulsion, in other words, religious freedom. So that's a new reading that Muslim scholars of the more modernist or reformist, uh, I think, uh, persuasion have been advocating in the past, let's say, two centuries. And my book was banned in Malaysia precisely because I advocated religious freedom based on such Quranic basis. Yeah, well, the, the, the pathway from a statement like that to a fully developed political and theological system that are separate in the details, but somehow still able to mutually function, and in some sense, one still containing the other, I would argue, you know, it, even in, in the United States, it's one country under God. It, that's in the background all the time in some sense. And I would also say that the elevation of the right to free speech as perhaps the primary right, and I'm speaking psychologically here to some degree, is a reflection in the political domain, I think, of what was being developed symbolically in Christian theology with the idea of the divine word. And, and that, that idea in many ways is older than Christianity. It's, it's older than Judaism as well. Like you can, you can, you can see, like I've traced that back to, for example, to the Mesopotamian writings about Marduk, who was that the, the God who emerged at the pinnacle of the Mesopotamian gods and who was the model for the sovereign of the Mesopotamian emperor. And he had eyes all the way around his head and he spoke magic words. And so even if you trace our stories back as far back as we've been able to trace them, the idea that there was something divine about the word itself, and, so, and, and we could have a discussion about what that divinity means. And I'm interested in doing that because you wrote this book, um, The Islamic Jesus, How the King of the Jews Became a Prophet of the Muslims. And that's, that's all of this. All of this is tangled up in some sense in the figure of Christ, historically and mythologically. And so in the West, I think we manage to maintain the relationship between the secular and the religious by putting forth these axiomatic rights, which are in some sense religious in their derivation, and they slotted nicely into the religious understructure, but then simultaneously allowed for enough freedom so the po political could do its own thing. And so that's partly why I'm so curious about your, your writings about Christ and about his place in Muslim thinking. Mm -hmm. Obviously in the West, whatever Christ was, is, was elevated to the highest place, right? Now, how do you understand? Now, I know Christ is a major figure in Islamic thinking, but there are differences. So can you help me can you wade me through that to some degree? Definitely. Uh, first of all, to answer the discussion, I should just maybe make one broad statement. And that is that in the Western world, in the 20th century, people began to speak about the Judeo-Christian tradition. And I think it's a very valuable way of looking into the world. Yes, there's a Judeo-Christian tradition. But I think there is something missing in that. There's Islam that is missing. Because I think I see the world history and I look at there is a Judeo-Christo-Islamic tradition. Because it's all Abrahamic monotheism mm -hmm, coming yeah. from actually from Judaism. And Judaism had began, I mean, historically in initiated monotheism. And then it had a big outburst with Christianity, the greatest outburst, but with the greatest world, world's greatest religion. But then it had, six centuries later, it had a second outburst with Islam, which spread monotheism in four corners of the world. I mean, there are people in living in Indonesia whose name is Moses or Abraham. I mean, why are they coming? I mean, because Islam brought this biblical yeah, well, that, story to that them. That brings us to, to a, 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 some instant discussion of what these three Abrahamic religions have in common that's extraordinarily deep. So, one, they're monotheistic. Two, they partake of the same tradition, as you've pointed out. And three, they all have, to one degree or another, an insistence that the bedrock of culture is a book, which is a very strange insistence. That yeah. it's, it's taken for granted in some sense yeah. because it's been insisted upon so long. But this is something that, like, it's very difficult to see in some ways that a book lasts longer than a city or an empire or a country. Yeah. And that yeah. there's, there's something profound about the notion that the bedrock of a culture should be a book. And there is an implicit respect for the word in that insistence. And that does unite those three religions in a very profound way. It does. And I think uh, it can 
it has created these amazing civilizations which advance human history. And I think the very fact that Islam, speaking of Islam, advance human history in terms of pluralism, in terms of law, in terms of religious toleration for its time, uh, I think is undeniable. And a lot of and and the fact that Islam even brought you know Greek philosophy because of its universalism. Muslims believe in the book, but they believe that reason is also from God. So they this created a universalistic outlook, and Muslims studied Aristotle and Plato and even carried them to Europe. So there is an Im- amazing history there, which are the positive things. But also there are times that these religious civilizations sometimes go into crisis and they go self-destructive and bitter. And that has happened in Europe. I mean, and if you look into 17th century, early 17th century Europe, and Catholics and Protestants were, you know, killing each other for sectarian reasons. I mean, heretics were being burned at the stake, and which led people like John Locke to seek a way out. And, and they did it by looking into the core of religion and saying that this is not what Christ had told us. I mean, Locke says, I mean, when I read his letter concerning toleration, I said, well, he's speaking of Christian issues, but he's speaking of our issues, too. The idea that should there be a Christian state or not, should heretics be persecuted or not. So he makes certain arguments or would religion be based on sincerity if it is coerced by the state? It wouldn't. So there's no point in coercion. So those kind of arguments are, I think, very interesting, which I that's why I, I believe in reading these traditions as by learning from each other instead of thinking, oh, they are the Christians and they have nothing to do with us or these are Muslims. They have nothing to do with us. Well, the problem, the problem with that perspective, you know, those are the Muslims and they have nothing to do with us, is that underneath such a presumption is, let's say, the presumption that Christians and Muslims can't talk. But even deeper that than that is the presumption on the part of the person making such a statement that their interpretation of Christianity is absolutely right. And that seems ridiculously presumptuous to me, you no, know, because I I don't think that you could find a Christian worth his salt, let's say, who would regard himself as as stellar an ex- exemplar of Christianity as Christ. And, you know, since we all fall short of the glory of God, we're all stupid and ignorant beyond belief. And so we have to listen to other people because they might know something we don't. And then, you see, if we, if we take that other attitude, then there's an implicit totalitarianism already there, which is, well, I'm right and you're not only wrong, but wrong in some way that's probably malevolent. And sometimes that's true, but it's not it's not a good way to start a conversation. It is not. And and I think religion becomes most dangerous when it is combined with group narcissism and acting uh, in the name of God to punish people for their sins and heresies, you know, as you define them. And that has happened in Islam. It still happens. I mean, groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, those terrorists, I mean, they are attacking Westerners, but they're attacking fellow Muslims too. And by defining them as heretics, I mean, we see bombs of Shiites being, uh, uh, sorry, mosques of Shiites being bombed by eight ISIS terrorists in the past, in the past two months, it happened twice. And this is a destructive dynamic, which has been always extreme in Islam, but existed. And, but there are antidotes to this sort of thinking as well. And, and I, I sometimes read those antidotes and I say, oh, in the Christian tradition, here's an example of that. I mean, if you can, uh, for example, let me give you an example. One, the big dispute in early Islam was who was the true Muslim? Like there was a civil war between the first Muslims, it's called the first fitna, first, and supporters of Ali and Muawiyah, the two figures, and I would sympathize with Ali, but they had a war. And, and there's a fanatic uh, faction called the Khawarij, the dissenters, and they said, these are both, they have gone wrong, they have sinned, because they have sinned, they're not Muslims, they become infidels, and infidels should be punished, so they started killing them. They were like the terrorists of the first century, always hated by mainstream Muslims. But what they were doing is to judge people and punish them in the name of God. But there was an alternative theology called Murja theology. And it's it's called Murja in Arabic means postponer. Uh, They said, on this issue of who's right and wrong, we don't know. We cannot judge. Only God can judge. So let's postpone this to afterlife to be resolved by God. And until then, until it is resolved by God in heaven, when we go there, We can live and let live. So they promoted toleration among Muslims. Now, this actually allowed calming down some of the early violence and broad coexistence in different uh, factions of Islam. And I think still it was brought into Sunni Islam by Abu Hanifa and the Hanafi school and had broader acceptance. Uh, 
Uh, and I was particularly struck to read something very similar uh, in John Locke in his letter concerning toleration. He says, there are different churches. For every church, the third is theirs. They are orthodox to themselves. And if one of them dominate government, they will persecute others. And he says, let's leave this to Almighty, the judge, to decide which doctrine is right. And in the meantime, let the government only protect the rights, the natural rights of all people and let people follow. That's part of the thorny psychological problem of rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. Because a lot of times now when people talk about tolerance, they insist that judgment is wrong. And in, in, in essence, in some, in some sense, and the reason they're afraid of judgment is because in its extremes, it can lead to the demonization of others. And we know exactly where that goes. But there's no dispensing with judgment. You can't even look at something without judgment because you have to pick what you're going to look at instead of something else. And you can't act without judgment. And so all of us are faced with this problem of, of well, what, what we should believe and and how we can be tolerant at the same time we believe, and how we can be tolerant at the same time that we have to judge. And in, there's a kernel in that, in that insistence by, by, by Locke. It was Locke you were referring to, or was it Mills? The letter, the letter on tolerance. I was just referring to John Locke, sorry. It's Locke, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I, I just slipped my mind for a second. It's very difficult for us to figure out what we can tolerate if we must simultaneously believe, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a problem I've been trying to work out psychologically mm -hmm. for a very long time. It's ex you do that, you see that in your own family, when you're a father, let's say, mm -hmm. because you obviously have to have tolerance for your children, but at the same time, you're, it's, you're obligated to show them the difference, let's say, between right and wrong, and also to help them separate the wheat from the chaff, which is judgment. And so, well, I, I totally see your, to the point, the balance you're pointing out here, but I agree with it. That's why I use the term tolerance, because, I mean, you might not need to accept everything and cherish and bless everything, but you need to accept different ways of life or theologies or doctrines. Uh, and by judgment, I mean, of course, we can have value judgments. I judge a lot of people in society. I say these people are bigoted or these people are arrogant and, and or their way of life is destructive for themselves. I have those judgments, but I'm not going to go and punish them in the name of God unless they attack me. So there should be a social order in which we can disapprove people, uh, ways of life, religious beliefs, theologies. And and I'm, our religions make truth statements, and we cannot get away from that. I mean, you say Christ is God. The other person will say, well, no, that's not acceptable for my theology. So there there are gaps that we cannot uh, and we should not you know, try to uh, make make this appear. But we can live together. And that's why tolerance is the key idea. And that's why by judgment, what I'm uh, referring to is judging and punishing in the name of God. And of course, crime will be punished. I mean, theft will be punished or murder will be punished. But if someone has a doctrine, religious doctrine that I find wrong, I should tolerate that person. Although I can, you know, criticize, of course, and, and we can and that and I can be criticized back, which what uh, free speech allows, of course, for us. So, I mean, sorry, you asked me about Christ, but I, I, uh, I mean, I opened a broader chapter, if you will. You, wanna, you want me to go into that discussion? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. that would be good. Uh, I mean, for a lot of Christians uh, who may not much know much about the Muslim world, I mean, it might be surprising to learn that the most prominent uh, female figure in the whole Quran is Mary. Uh, actually, she's the only woman mentioned by name. There's a chapter named Mary. Uh, there is a chapter named after her family, Ali Imran. And, and the Quran, because, because the, the, the calling of the Quran is to say, this is a new, this is not a new religion. This is monotheism. Muhammad is God's messenger, but God had other messengers before. There was Moses, there was Abraham, there was Jesus Christ, and there was his uh, Mary. And the Quran tells the story of Mary to affirm something which is. Uh, again, might be surprising to Christians. The Quran affirms the virgin birth of Christ, that uh, Mary was a chaste woman. She didn't, she was not touched by any man. And one day she heard an angel coming and say, you will have a son. And she says, how can I have a son? No man has ever touched me. But, it, but the, the angel says, this is what God willed and uh, he wills and he creates. So that is how Christ, Christ, you know, uh, comes 
to you know his his mother's uh, womb, and ultimately he comes, and the Quran calls him the Word of God. Again, this is a very powerful statement. If you if you if one is f- familiar with the Gospel of John, and this is very unusual, but the same Quran also insists that he was not divine, so he should not be worshipped. So on the one hand, it reverses Mary and Jesus. It tells a lot of things, very similar to Gospel of Luke. And some apocryphal gospels also resonate strongly with the Quran, interestingly. Uh, so there's great respect, great reverence. There are good words about Christians. I mean, one in words, one verse, uh, the Quran says, among all people, you will love the Christians nearest to the believers. Uh, that, that's the Muslims. Because it says they're not arrogant and they have learned, uh, they have learned scholars. And uh, so there are a lot of positive things because... Islam was born, let, let's not forget that Islam was born as a monotheist campaign in an idolatrous society. Mm. Uh, Meccans were worshipping idols and Prophet Muhammad, who didn't think of becoming a prophet until the age of 40, he heard the voice in a cave, uh, Angel Gabriel, like a burning bush experience of Moses, which told him, recite in the name of God who created man. And then uh, he became convinced that he's God's prophet and he started to preach monotheism. And when you preach monotheism, and Muslims considered Jews and Christians as their allies. That's why when Muslims were Muslims were persecuted in uh, Mecca, Prophet Muhammad told a group of Muslims to flee to Ethiopia, the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia. They went there and they were really saved by the Christian king. That's a you know, memory that Muslims have. So there is that monotheistic... So what, what does it mean in Islam that Christ... Well, two things that you said, that, that Christ is... That his birth is... The virgin birth is accepted. That's that's a major issue, which we should also discuss, and also the emphasis on Mary and what that means, let's say, for the position of women theologically within Islam, and, and also what does it mean when Muslims claim, believe, that Christ is the Word of God? Now, it's hard for me as a Westerner to separate that out from claims of divinity. And, and, and we could also talk in some sense about worship, about what worship means. And so when I, I try to look at these things from a psychological perspective mm-hmm. as much as mm-hmm. possible and stay out of theological territory where I'm a neophyte in any case. Um, one of the things that worship means to me psychologically is something like the desire or compulsion to imitate. And like mm-hmm. you think about, To worship something is to place it in the place of highest value. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people claim to think that actions speak louder than words. And I think that's a reasonable proposition. If you act something out, it's pretty compelling evidence that you believe it. And that means in some ways that you hold it in the highest place. And so to worship is to imitate, I think, in the deepest sense. Um, it might be to celebrate what should be imitated as well, something like that. And this is a complicated issue because we're unbelievably imitative. Mm-hmm. And I was struck when my kids were little, when they were playing house, for example, my son would play out the father. And you might say, well, he was copying his dad. But he wasn't because he wasn't moving the same way he saw me move. What he was doing was watching me over a whole variety of instances And then also watching portrayals of fathers in media, movies and TV shows and that sort of thing, and abstracting out from that some kind of, I would call it like a disembodied spirit, which represented the core essence of paternity, and then imitating that. And and I see in that the the biological underpinnings, let's say, of what religious people talk about when they talk about worship. So when the Muslim world regards Christ as the word of God, but, but not divine, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to understand that. Uh, very good question. I mean, I, it, it says in the Quran that he is a word from God and it doesn't explain much. And Muslims discuss what this means exactly. Uh, it's not certainly understood mm. in the way that the Gospel of John defines that word was word was with God and word was God. Mm-hmm. So that's At not the beginning the step. of time. Yeah, no, that, that's not the step taken there. Most common interpretations said, well, he was the word of God in the sense that God, uh, it was the word of God directed to Mary. So God, he was created with the creative word be in Mary's body. So that's what it means. 
So that's generally a like a low interpret low Christology, if you will. Mm -hmm. But there are alternative views, which I mentioned, you know, in my book uh, in uh, the Islamic Jesus, that some people said maybe he was wor the word of God in the sense that he was the revelation itself. Like everything he did and said was revelation, like God's living word. Which still, though, from an Islam, which which means he was something like the Quran. Like Quran, we believe is revelation, God's revelation. So he was, he was the revelation became flesh rather than revelation became a book, right? And that's why the New Testament narrates about Jesus. I mean, it's it, he is the he is the revelation, and, and New Testaments are reports about the revelation. So that's I think that's possible to uh, that's a step possible to take within the Quranic framework. However, still Muslims don't worship the Quran. I mean. You say still God is beyond. I mean, God is another transcendent at, at another transcendent level. And in Islam, okay, okay, there's so a very let's, so let's let's talk about that in relationship okay. to the totalitarian impulse. Okay, I mean, I was I just had a discussion with Sam Harris, and I mentioned that I was going to be talking to some Islamic scholars. I didn't mention you by name, and I asked him if he might want to participate in such a discussion. He said he's done that. He's done there. And he's been there and done that, and so he wasn't particularly interested in that. Um, although we had a, a wonderful conversation. This episode was brought to you by Elysium Health. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you've heard me talk about Elysium and their products, Basis and Matter. I'm very excited to tell you about their new supplement, Format, for immune health. Powered by three great complexes and three foundational micronutrients, Format is the first and only product to take this innovative two-system approach to immune health, combining a daily supplement with a monthly senolytic for next generation immune support. Why Elysium? First off, they have dozens of the world's best scientists working with them, and eight of them are Nobel Prize winners. Elysium was founded by MIT's Dr. Leonard Guarante, one of the first specialists in aging science with over 30 years of research in the field. They know what they're doing. Format's Senolytic Complex, which is based on research done at the Mayo Clinic, clears problematic cells that slow down the immune system. Over time, some of our cells stop working as well as they used to, but linger in the body and cause inflammation, a bit like trash that needs to be taken out. This is known as cellular senescence. It happens at all ages and accelerates as you get older. Stress caused by free radicals can also trigger cellular senescence, driving immune system aging and keeping it from performing at its peak. It's time to think proactively about our immune systems. What sets Format apart is its unique two-system approach to targeting the cellular processes that impact the performance of your immune system. If you want to try this next-generation patented supplement by Elysium, they have a special offer now for JBP listeners. Go to tryformat.com slash Jordan and enter code JBP10 at checkout to save 10% off Format prepaid plans as well as other Elysium health supplements. That's tryformat.com slash Jordan code JBP10 at checkout for 10% off. But one of the, what, what I see happening very frequently with thinkers like Harris, and, and I'm saying this with all due respect, I truly am, is that for them, there is very little distinction between the religious and the totalitarian. And that's the essence of the objection. Now, Sam has come to regard some domains as sacred. And we talked a lot about that. And I think that it's, I think it's an understatement of the severity of the totalitarian problem to attribute it merely to the religious. And the part of the reason I think that is, well, look what happened in the 20th century in the West. It's like, well, there was the Nazis and how about Mao, and then there's Stalin, and, you know, you could say those were religions, but, you know, you're pretty, you're weaselly, we're, you're using weasel words at that point, you expand the definition of what constitutes religion, so it doesn't violate your initial presuppositions, and so we could see in Christianity, and in Judaism, and in Islam, the constant human struggle to deal with whatever is the totalitarian impulse, which is something like insistence that what I already know is, well, is literally the word of God. It's in some sense, it's absolutely true. I have the knowledge. There shall be no deviation from that. And, and to, to us, to identify that with 
tradition in religion, I think, is a big mistake. It's, it, it doesn't get to the issue. I'm totally on the same page with you on that. I mean, uh, the history of 20th century shows that some of the greatest crimes against humanity were, consider- were committed by secular ideologies. I mean, communism and Nazism, as you well put. Uh, and today, probably the worst totalitarian regimes in the world. I mean, number one is North Korea. I mean, it's it's not a really it's a secular state, but it's a bit a juche called ideology, but it's totally secular. So, being I mean, I'm in favor of a secular state in terms of a neutral state that respects everybody's rights regardless of religion or creed. But secularization of society it doesn't necessarily bring anything good. I mean, we have seen okay, that. I mean, okay, so let's talk about that for a second. So I've been trying to figure out. All right. So one of the things I realized a long time ago as a psychologist was that there were depths of meaning. And we have intimations of this constantly. So, for example, we can read a book and we think that was shallow and we can read another book and we think that was deep. And then when we talk to a bunch of other people, they tend to think that the shallow book was shallow and the deep book was deep. And they tend to think that shallow and deep actually means something. And so there's this, there's this experience of depth. Mm-hmm. Now, I've tried to figure out what that meant exactly. And what occurred to me was that, and this was partly derived from watching people in my clinical practice. So imagine people will get much more upset about a pending divorce than they will about a discussion about who should do the dishes. And you think, well, that's obvious. It's like, yeah, it's, it's obvious because that's what happens to you. But It isn't easy to explain. So what I thought was, what I hypothesized was something like, we have representations of the world of different sizes and different temporal expanses. A small plan for the day nested inside a plan for the week, nested inside a plan for the month, the year, nested inside our family, nested inside our community, nested inside our polity, nested inside our theology. Okay, and the deeper you go, the more those representations are dependent on, uh, the more representations are dependent on that level. Mm -hmm. And so when something happens to you where you're deeply affected or traumatized, let's say technically, what's happened is that you've taken a blow to a representation upon which almost all your other representations depend. Mm -hmm. And so then you could think technically about the difference between the secular and the religious as being one of depth. Once you go down to the fundamental substrata, so that would be the most axiomatic of presuppositions, mm-hmm. whether you're secular or not, you're in the religious domain. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, so, I mean, the people who call themselves secular, and of course I have many friends who are secular and I respect that point of view, but they have, metaphysical beliefs at the end of the day. I mean, if you say the universe always existed and matter made us and, you know, th- that's your creation story. I mean, every every worldview has ultimately a metaphysical uh, dimension, I think, even if, 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 if it does accept. Like coming back to your totalitarianism point, though, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have totalitarian entities right now, I mean, in the world, in the name of Islam. I mean, I think the Iranian Republic is pretty much the Islamic Republic of Iran, pretty close to that. Saudi Arabia uh, is, is, I mean, very oppressive. And these are the two most oppressive interpretations of Islam. ISIS is like Khmer Rouge. I mean, he was the Khmer Rouge of the Islamic spectrum. So it was pretty evil and very, I think, totalitarian too. But there was something, though, in classical Islam, although I have a lot of criticisms towards medieval jurisprudence, but there was a value in classical Islam. And that, that value was in, in this word, which is a generally scary word in the Western today, and that's the Sharia, you know, that's God's law. Uh, I mean, I, there are two phases of the Sharia. There are a lot of things about women and apostasy and blasphemy that I keep criticizing that we have to reform those aspects. But there was another value in the Sharia, which highlighted in my uh, book, new book, Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty. The Sharia was a set of laws that were separate from the rulers. They were even, even above the rulers. Like Sharia wasn't what the Sultan required or you know, wanted. The Sharia was the law of God articulated by scholars who were generally independent of the rulers. And that's why the classical medieval Islamic civilization wasn't totalitarian. There were a lot of autocratic rulers, tyrants, but they were 
mitigated by the Sharia. And and I I tell a story. Well, this is also something that I think people like Harris, let's say, and and those atheist rationalists, I think they fail to understand the necessity of that. So I mentioned ancient Mesopotamia a while back, but one thing that happened in, in that society was that the emperor would be taken outside the, the gates of the city, so it was a walled city, once a year at the New Year's festival, and he would be stripped of his emperor, emperor garb and forced to kneel, and then the priest would slap him with a glove, and he would be forced to recite all the ways that he hadn't been an appropriate Marduk, which was the high god, for the last year. So he hadn't seen what he should see if he wasn't being blind, and he hadn't said what he should have said if he was speaking the right kind of magic. And so he was he was humbled in front of what was highest. And the Mesopotamians were working hard. You know, in their mythology, you see this battle between the gods in the face of an apocalyptic danger. And this is a very common story worldwide, this battle between the gods, so what's highest, in the face of an ap apocalyptic danger and the emergence of a supreme principle, which constitutes the essence of sovereignty itself. And if you have a society, a secular society, let's say, where that highest thing isn't outside the polity in some sense, then you have North Korea, where the leader is elevated to the status of a god. And then you have hell. And that seems like a bad idea. Exactly. You have Stalin, you have Mao, you have uh, all those modern dictators. And you have the Islamist you know, totalitarian regimes today, because the Islamist totalitarians of today differ from the classical medieval Islamic tradition. I mean, imagine, uh, I mean, look at Taliban today. I mean, Taliban has dominated Afghanistan once again. Uh, the head of the Taliban is also the head of the executive and the judiciary <laughs> and the, ex I mean, legislation. So that wasn't like that in classical Islam. That was a ruler but there were also scholars who were independent from the, they were independent in the beginning and uh, rulers gradually actually co-opted scholars. And that was the beginning of the doom of the decline of the Islamic civilization. My friend Ahmed Kuru has a very good book about that. He shows how the scholars, religious scholars who developed law were gradually co-opted by the state, by the rulers. And that actually killed the diversity and dynamism of Islamic thought. Yeah, well, it means the that they've, lo they've been lowered from the, from the ultimate to the, to the political particular, and, and that's a catastrophe. Exactly. And uh, I mean, there are many tales in Islamic civilization. Today, I think we can highlight to uh, articulate values like rule of law or separation of powers. I mean, I tell one of them, for example, we know that in Ottoman uh, history, Ottoman sultans were stopped by rulers sometimes from executing people out of just anger or confiscating property or overtaxing the population. They said, this tax is not compatible with the Sharia. You can overtax people. So they, so there was a balance in the classical Islamic civilization, which worked for its time. And let's not forget that classical Islamic civilization had a toleration, which again, was not very common at the time. That's why when Jews were persecuted in Europe, they often fled to the Islamic lands. I mean, the Ottoman Empire. Unfortunately, today we have a crisis in the Islamic civilization. We lost some of the blessings of the classical tradition. That tradition itself stagnated, its jurisprudence stagnated. And then we had the modern state and this, these Islamic movements came with the passion to grab the modern state and use it in the name of Islam, which created a deadly mix of medieval jurisprudence and modern totalitarianism, which is the story of uh, the Iranian Islamic Republic of Iran. Saudi Arabia is going to towards that direction. You know, under, now let's uh, talk about the Saudis yeah. for a sec, if you don't mind. I mean, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, I, because why, why not do something incredibly yeah. dangerous? I mean, yeah. I, I am stunned at the naivety of the West in rendering unto the Wahhabis a, a fortune of staggering magnitude and thinking that in some way this was a recipe for medium and long-term peace. Yeah. I mean, I don't, how, why do you think we're so stupid? Just out of curiosity. I mean, I think every government in the world is stupid in the sense that, you know, they make decisions on very short-term interests without really understanding the long-term long consequences. The stupidity of Western governments just have more impact because they have more power, you know, to, to shape things. Uh, regarding to Wahhabis, I mean, for, for example, I mean, first of all, let's establish what Wahhabism is. Wahhabism yes. is, I mean... I compare, first of all, Islam should be compared more to Judaism than Christianity to make, I think, meaningful analogies. Uh, 
because of its theology is very similar to Judaism and the idea of law, Sharia and Halakha are very similar traditions. So in Islam, Sunni Islam is like Orthodox Judaism. It's the mainstream body, right? It's traditional conservative, but it has some flexibility. Uh, and then there's the ultra orthodox, you know, tradition uh, in Judaism. So Wahhabism represents the ultra orthodox point of view with a violent and intolerant uh, bent to it. So that emerged in the 18th century in the Ottoman Empire, and their first targets were other Muslims. I mean, they con they condemned the Ottoman Empire for being into a heresy and bidah, as they call it, innovation. They attacked Sunnis, uh, fellow Sunnis, and also slaughtered Shiites, which they consider as heretics. Then when the Ottoman Empire banned slave trade in the middle of the 19th century, there was a revolt in Hijaz uh, fueled by Wahhabis. They said Turks have gone infidels because slavery is in our jurisprudence. You cannot change that, though, although the Ottomans were more flexible in their understanding. But until the 20th century, Wahhabism was a very regressive, like a force in the middle of the Arabian desert, Najd, which people didn't know, they didn't go there. It was a very marginal force. In the 20th century, these people discovered that uh, they are sitting on the world, on top of the world's richest oil reserves, which they consider as a blessing from God to use, you know, to advance their understanding. And also, Western powers thought that, oh, we can use them. We, I mean, we can get a deal with them. First, the British. First, the British thought that they, they could be used against the Ottoman Empire. Uh, th there was even some discussion that they are like Protestantism, which are potentially more tolerant, which is... Not, I mean, they're not like Protestants, but they were certainly not tolerant. So that was one thing, first of all, because the Ottoman Empire being the seat of the caliphate and the superpower, that was the problem. Although you would prefer the Ottomans to the Wahhabis by any definition because of their toleration and pluralism for their time. And then, of course... In so the so you're, you're making the case to some degree, if I understand you right, that a, poli a, a totalitarian doctrine, let's say, was granted exceptional riches, which there's no possibility they could have accrued had that theology, that totalitarian theology, had to make its way in the, its own way in the world. But because of the vagaries of fate, in some sense, there was immense riches mm -hmm. at at the fingertips of this movement that would have otherwise been and likely remained extraordinarily isolated. What? Uh, yes. What? What I'm saying is that I mean. Uh, there are. I'm not saying that the classical Islamic world was full. I mean, it was not ideal. There was a lot of persecution of heretics, and here and there too. But for its time, uh, you wouldn't judge the classical Islamic and civilization and say they have less religious freedom compared to what was there at Christendom at the time. That's where. That's why Jews repeatedly fled to the Muslim world, for example, from uh, Spain to the Ottoman Empire. In the modern era, one problem is Islamic jurisprudence. The interpretation of the Sharia stagnated, and why that happened is a big discussion among Muslims, but that, that's one problem. This episode was sponsored by Canva. Making content is an essential part of what I do to keep this show going. Well, I've outsourced that now, but in the beginning, it was me making all the graphics. Canva Pro makes this process seamless. Graphics can be designed on any device. If you don't know who they are, Canva is an excellent design platform made to create and share content. You can choose from thousands of templates and customize them for your projects or just start from scratch. Canva Pro is Canva's premium version and it has an absurd amount of variety. If you're part of a team, Canva Pro's content planner, which is a great addition, can help you stay organized and really streamline planning, creating, and posting by having it all happen in one place. You and four teammates can unlock everything Canva Pro has to offer for just $12.99 a month. Start designing like a pro with Canva Pro. Right now, you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you use our promo code. Just go to canva.me slash Peterson to get your free 45-day extended trial. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash Peterson. Canva.me slash Peterson. I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. And and the idea of a modern state came. The modern state with its police and with its national law controlling everything, with its bureaucracy, and it come and Islamist movements emerged saying that we will revive the Sharia by grabbing the modern state by all its centralized power, and that created the totalitarian moment uh, in Islamic tradition. And and we see that in Saudi Arabia, we see that in Iran, we, we are seeing that in under the Taliban. Uh, so there is. And one problem is that Islamic world 
in the past two centuries modernized, but we didn't get the good forms of modernity. Uh, one thing, I mean, first of all, the only secularism Muslims experienced was, was the French style secularism, which generally pushed back the believers. Because if you say, I'm bringing you secularism, it's a wonderful thing, which means you will not be able to wear a headscarf and go to the campus. Well, there's not much freedom in that secularism. So um, unfortunately, it, give, it gave bad name to that. Secondly, Arab uh, republics uh, got influenced by Soviet communism. I mean, Arab socialism was a very powerful move mm -hmm. in the middle of the 20th century. Republican Turkey, my country, uh, it, it's, it westernized, it's good, but you know, it acquired its legal system from fascist Italy uh, in the 1930s. Because let's not forget, I mean, the West was not always a liberal democratic heaven. There were a lot of bad ideas that came from the West. So I see this today in the Islamic civilization, a really a perfect storm, a crisis of some, we lost some of the traditions we have, some of the toleration and pluralism we had back then. There's a stagnant jurisprudence and bad ideas of modernity came. And when you mix them, there's a crisis in every society. And, and, and that's why I think we Muslims need ideas that will be new, different than what we have before, but that should be rooted in the tradition. Bad ideas from the West are, in fact, devastating. I mean, when cultures object to Western hegemony in favor of their local traditions, let's say, I have a certain amount of, uh, what would you say, understanding of why they're doing that, because the ideas that emerged after the Renaissance, let's say, especially the ideas that undermined religious tradition, are unbelievably difficult to withstand. And that's still causing all sorts of trouble in the West. And it's caused all sorts of political trouble in the West, not least this development of this absolutely anti-liberal totalitarianism that you saw in both Nazism and communism. And in the West, you know, we like to look at free modernity and say, well, that's, that's us in the last 500 years. But those offshoots, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany are just as much a part of that tradition as well, as, as the more positive elements of modernity. And so, and that's where, that's why I think that this conflation of the totalitarian impulse with the religious impulse is dangerous. Now, I understand though, there's another issue here that's lurking beneath the surface constantly is that there's the spiritual element in some sense of, re, of religious the perception and practice. And there's the tradition. And you know, you see those juxtaposed to some degree in the New Testament, when the Pharisees and the and the lawyers attempt to trap Christ into saying something heretical when they ask him to rank order the Mosaic commandments, what's the most important commandment, which implies that some of them aren't so important. And he just sidesteps that so absolutely brilliantly and says, well, if I remember correctly, that you should love God above all else and love your brother like yourself. And, yeah. and what he did there was extract out the essence of the root tradition and make that into something that's an embodied, dynamic, conscious practice. And that's, it's one of those stories you read and you think, what the hell was going on there? How could someone come up with an answer like that? That's such a devastating, remarkable, creative mm -hmm. answer. And of course, mm -hmm. It's had a huge impact on the civilization of the world since then. But, you know, the people who criticize religion, the, the materialist atheist types, for example, they constantly conflate the problem of the totalitarian proclivity that tradition tends towards, if unchecked, with religion itself. And that's a huge problem because those aren't the same thing. They're not. And I think uh, religion obviously has become oppressive in world history when it when it combines with state power it becomes the same thing with state power and that's what theocracy and we have examples of that in christian history and obviously in islamic history but religion can also be a balance to power it can hold values outside of the power sphere and actually check power so and i think there are grounds for that in the christian tradition and and of course in the islamic tradition and we have to cultivate those but I think this whole discussion of religion and power requires a rethinking of the very birth story of Islam, how Prophet Muhammad came and what he preached. So, uh, and I have some ideas, some some reformist perspectives there. I mean, I can speak about that a little. Please bit. Please do, will. please do. Uh, here's here's one thing that here's one thing that clouds uh, thinking thinking about Islam by sometimes Muslims and by sometimes others. Uh, 
And that is that in the very beginning of Islam, you see Prophet Muhammad, a preacher, a preacher of monotheism, a prophet, but also somebody who led armies, who led battles, mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. established a state. So what is going on? Right, so right. That's why, I mean, some people say, you know, in Christianity, it's much easier to make the case for a secular state. But in Islam, it's much more difficult because they have the state at the very beginning. And it also makes Muhammad into quite a, a frightening figure. I mean, on the one hand, when I look at what he did, the fact that it 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 fits in this pattern that has happened time and time again in religious history, where the warring I idolatry was united into a monotheism, and that's a civilizing force. It means that it means integration, and of course the the empire that resulted was one of the largest empires that humans have ever created. It was an unbelievable achievement. So there's this push towards monotheism and insistence on a highest, like transcendent value. But as you just pointed out at the same time, well, yeah, but there was war and there was conquest and that's absent from the story of Christ yeah. completely. And so it's, it's quite frightening from a Western perspective. I understand that, but, that's why I think we need a discussion about that, which I, you know, offer in in my books, especially uh, reopening Muslim minds. And I calling I call for understanding why Prophet Muhammad had to fight wars. Was that a divine blueprint that he had to fulfill, or was that a accident of history that he was forced into? I mean, and before that, I'll just say one thing. Uh, there are, I mean, we have to compare Islam and Christianity, but to understand Islam, also always check uh, the Old Testament. Because I think the his, uh, story of Prophet Muhammad is also very similar to the story of Moses and also the later Joshua and the you know wars in the land of Canaan. And so there are a lot of Old Testament parallels there. So here is what happened at the very birth of Islam. Prophet Muhammad began preaching monotheism in the city of Mecca in year 2010. Actually, he didn't preach publicly in the beginning. For three years, they were secret. There were just about 40 people. Gra gradually, it became a community and they publicly began preaching there's one god and no god right and of course the god of abraham it was very clear that it's a continuation of the abrahamic tradition now for 10 years because of this they were persecuted the the pagan uh, big grandees of the city the the leaders of the tribes they said to muhammad you're insulting our religion you're defying our gods you're insulting our forefathers in other words, they uh, accuse Prophet Muhammad for blasphemy against their religion, and which I think should be in the minds of every Muslim today on free speech issues. Um, and But Muslims didn't give up, but Muslims didn't threaten. There was no act of violence. Muslims were not trying to found an army. And actually, there are passages in the Quran which shows that Muslims were just preaching their faith. And one of them reads, to you, your religion, and to me, mine. I mean, that was a statement uh, made to the pagans. Another one says, the, Lord, the truth is from your Lord, let anyone who want to believe it, believe it. Let anyone who want to disbelieve it, disbelieve it. In other words, says to Muhammad, oh, Muhammad, you're just a preacher. You're not a compeller over people. And if God had willed, everybody would believe, but, you know, God led it this way. So there's a very non, there's a non-political and non-violent message right there in Mecca. Now, I ask a question that generally people didn't ask. What if the Meccan said, okay, do what you do, right? And what if the Meccans said, let the Muslims go and preach their religion? I think the history of Islam would be different because Muslims were just going to peacefully preach the faith. Probably the faith would grow and it would gradually win over the city and still the Kaaba would be transformed into a monotheistic temple, but it would be a different history. What rather happened is that they, they persecuted the Muslims. They killed Muslims. Some of them had to flee to Ethiopia, as I said. They were almost coming to clo uh, kill Prophet Muhammad himself, assassinate him. And that's why he finally fled Mecca and went to the city, Yathrib, called Medina later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there he established a community. He established a group of people. He became a political leader in the city. And all their properties were plundered after they were left. Their homes were raided and they were sold. Uh, they were raided by the pagans. And then came the first verse of the Quran, which allowed war, jihad, I mean, military jihad in the name of God. And that verse in Surah Hajj is very interesting. It says, permission to fight has been given to those who have been persecuted. They were persecuted because they said our Lord is one. They were driven out of their homes because they said our Lord is one. 
So the war aspect, the war part of the story was a reaction to persecution, the ongoing persecution. Once you start war, it went on. There were many battles. Like in the 10 last years, uh, the, the, the 10 years in Mecca, there are raids, there are battles, there are fights. And when you read the Quran today in certain chapters, Surah 9, for example, Surah Tawbah, you will see harsh passages. Go and fight the unbelievers. Go and find them. Go and kill them. You know, And those are historical commandments directing the first Muslim community. Just like commandments in the Old Testament tell, telling Joshua or the Israelites you know, to fight the, Alamec, uh, the Amalekites, you know, the tribes in the land of Canaan that were trying to kill the Israelites. So I understand the war aspect there as an outcome of a oppressive environment which wouldn't let Islam to grow and even exist. So Muslims had to fight, not because they wanted, but they were forced into. However, a problem well, came the, after that. The whole that. thorny moral problem of what you should do when you're oppressed is not something that we've, as a species, let's say, have completely figured out. I mean, in Christianity, I would say you know, or propose that one of the prime injunctions is to turn the other cheek, but that 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 didn't seem to apply so obviously. Let's say in in the decades leading to World War Two. And and so yeah, yeah. it's not like every society doesn't have to wrestle with this problem. I mean, Christ is presented as a peacemaker. There's no doubt about that. But he's also presented in the book of Revelation as a judge who separates the damned from the elect. And there's a harshness in that as well. And so I don't but, think it's... Go ahead. Uh, sorry, but there is an additional problem. I mean, I mean, the farming story is not a problem, but I think we have to understand it correctly that war was a consequence of that particular context and what is eternal about islam to me is the theology the the faith the practice and the worship that was brought by islam but there was an additional problem after Pro prophet muhammad passed away uh, muslims had an army and a state and mm -hmm. they kept continuing i mean they kept uh conquering the world and from in one century from spain to uh india basically muslims built an empire and this empire itself partly transformed Islamic teaching and adjusted it to its imperial needs. And I think that's something we Muslims should see today. One clear example of this is the theory of abrogation. Uh, because the, the jurists who were with the imperial project, they looked at the Quran and, and they saw that, well, there are verses in the Quran which says, uh, you're, not a, you're just a uh, preacher, not a compeller. Well, but we're having a war here, right? Like, I mean, to you, your religion, to me, mine, but we are not allowing the polytheists to, to have this. So what they did was they took the verses about war and fighting the unbelievers, the polytheists in particular, but also Jews and Christians, because there was a word about uh, the people of the book. They took those verses as definitive, which abrogated the earlier verses. So a lot of the verses you will open and read the Quran today, which are tolerant, peaceful, you know, lenient. Uh, if you read medieval jurisprudence, you will find notes that the worst is there in the Quran, but it's abrogated. Like it doesn't have mm -hmm, a function. Mm -hmm, it doesn't rule. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a hukum. Uh, which to me is well, it's not... it's a huge problem when you're dealing with a text as complicated as the Quran or let's say the Bible, where taken singly, there are certainly passages that contradict one another. And so then, well, then you are tempted by the desire to justify your own unquestioned beliefs because of your demand for power using reference to God. And then it's a worse problem than that, too, because, well, who's right in their interpretation? You know, and the, well, the way out of that, in some sense, is to approach a book like that with as much admission of your own ignorance and as much humility as possible so that I mean, if you assume that such thing is reasonable, given that we're all people of the book, and, and pray to God in some sense that you don't bend that to your own unacknowledged malevolence and ignorance. But that's a very, very difficult thing to manage, and it isn't even clear when you manage it, which is why we need to talk to each other in part. And it, exactly. And I see this abrogation theory and, and the theory of jihad and conquest and, and coercion built around that, which is right, honestly right there in the Islamic uh, jurisprudence, in medieval interpretations of the Sharia, as Islam interpreted for the age of empires. 
I mean, it was how empires were behaving at the time. Christians were doing the same things too. I mean, Byzantine Empire was also expanding through uh, war. Uh, they had anti-paganism laws. Religious coercion was the norm of the day. Islam was born in such a world and it took a imperial form and jurisprudence. But to me, it was not a divine blueprint that we Muslims should preserve forever. It was a different context and we live in a different world today. So that's why we have to reinterpret. And to me, the abrogated verses of the Quran are the eternal messages of Islam. Uh, th- those abrogated verses, which says to you, your religion, to me, mine. And okay, so, no wh- so why, why would you, why? Okay, so let me play devil's advocate here. I mean, you're making, you're making a judgment there and it's a non-trivial judgment. And you could say also that it's an unbelievably presumptuous judgment. And this is not an insult at all. This is independent of whether or not I, I agree with you, but we run right into this thorny problem, right? Which is, well, why, on what grounds do you think you're justified in making the claim that your interpretation should supersede that particular interpretation? Very good question. Uh, First of all, I begin with showing that I begin by showing that the existing interpretation, the imperial interpretation, let's say, which relied on expensive jihad, coercion, suppression of heresy, apostasy laws, blasphemy laws, that's all part of that. By showing that this was not a inevitable interpretation, it was an interpretation based on imperial conditions. And I showed that people who dissented against those two. I mean, in my book, in Reopening Muslim Minds, I said, well, this became the mainstream view. But wait, wait, there was a scholar who was actually, you know, arguing against that. There was a scholar who was saying, no, we don't need abrogation. We just need to understand it as one big story with different emphases. There were, so there were, uh, and I show how these were cynically used by Muslim rulers sometimes to just get rid of dissent. I mean, some Muslims early critics of uh, the Umayyad dynasty, which was a mostly a tyrannical dynasty that dominated the Islamic world, they were killed as blasphemers or apostates, but they were only critics of the r- rulers. So this okay, was so, used- so let me ask you. Okay, so let me ask you another question. So you've, you've spent a lot of time on this. You've written many books and you've put yourself in some danger, I would say. And, and this has been quite successful. And so I want to know what you're up to you know what I mean? It's like you're you're aiming at something with all these books, and maybe you don't even fully know what it is because you realize these things as you write, right, and as you struggle. And so I would say for a book like the Bible, like there's a way that you have to approach it, I believe, that – what would you say? So that you're the least likely to deceive yourself about what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And that has to be something like – I think it has to be something like an orientation towards love. Mm-hmm. And love is something like the desire that the the most possible good happens to the most possible people. I don't mean to be utilitarian about it. I'm, I'm not making that kind of case. But it even extends to your enemies because, well, wouldn't it be better if they didn't have such miserable lives? And wouldn't it be better if you didn't have enemies? And so you have to approach a, a traditional text in the spirit that the text fundamentally embodies, or you bend it to your own will. Now, you what are you aiming at with all your books? What What is it that you want? That's a good question. Well, what do I want? I want to make, as a, just a ordinary but thinking Muslim, I want to make a contribution to, to the future of my religion in this day and age where I see great value in Islam. I think Islam can contribute to the world in many ways. But I also see Islam being still captured by some medieval interpretations that were actually using was was used and built up for medieval imperial projects and and i need i believe we need to rethink certain issues in islam and there are a lot of scholars doing this i mean that's why i believe mm-hmm. i speak of the 19th century islamic modernism i mean i, I learned from these scholars from fazl rahman to uh, muhammad abduh to ottoman liberals and today some contemporary scholars that i quote in my book as well but uh, scholars write in academic articles so I, 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 or very uh, complicated books. I try to popularize these ideas because I mm-hmm. see there's hunger for that. I mean, there are a lot of Muslims mm-hmm. around the world today, from Pakistan to Malaysia to Indonesia to the Arab world, who are faithful, who are happy with their religion, but they are disturbed, sometimes disgusted by the things they see in the name of their religion. Oppression, violence, uh, 
persecution of innocent people by calling them heretics and so on and so forth. And they want to see a way forward. How can we go forward by preserving our faith, living our values, but also being at peace with non-Muslims and even Muslims of different persuasion? And we can have and a so teaching. So do you, do you see that, that what is perturbing them is the manifestation of that central totalitarian spirit? It is totalitarian or just sometimes bigoted and hateful. It, I mean, to be totalitarian, it has to be unified with power, but it, it, it is potentially totalitarian. So, yeah, well, there's the psychological equivalent. Psycho that, exactly. Right? And, and I also see that this is, uh, make, this is also leading to a great disenchantment with Islam as well. I mean, a lot of people are not in the West thinking about that. They think uh, Muslim world, everybody's pious, but quite the contrary. There is a great escape from Islam in Iran. I mean, Iran today is the number one country in the world that produces ex-Muslims, like uh, people who become atheists and Christians. And I respect their point of view. I mean, they have all the right to become atheists or Christians. But as a Muslim who believes in my faith, I mean, like I would like to have a faith that attracts people with its spirituality and with its values, but not frightens them and scares them and pushes them away. In Turkey, my country, there is a new tide of deism, which is like young people are believing in God, but not any religion and certainly not Islam, precisely because of the disenchantment uh, of Islam being used for authoritarian politics by the current government, for example. So I think this is a critical period in Islam. And when I look back in Christian history, I see people, uh, Christian humanists from Locke to others, Roger Williams in the United States, who rearticulated their religion, reinterpreted their religion to emphasize freedom, freedom of conscience. Uh, like, I mean, the switch from divine rights of kings to the idea of a you know limited government with, uh, which, with religious freedom, that was a big shift in Christianity. And it had to be done by Christians who value their faith. And I, I think this is a big effort. A lot of Muslims are trying. I'm just trying to do my part with my writings, which are aimed at a broad understanding with a broad population. So everybody can read and get it, you know, what the, what the point is. But also here are the key arguments and, and uh, the you know, patterns for going forward. Yeah, well, you're you're a strange sort of traditionalist in some sense, right? Because you are trying to separate the wheat from the chaff in relationship to the past, but also not proposing that all of this be abandoned as an entirely failed project, which I think is a very naive would be a very naive thing to do in any case. It's like, well, abandon it in favor of what exactly? Well, you know, rationality. It's well, okay, but it's a, it needs some fleshing out. Well, not by rationality. I mean, we can discuss that because, you know, my book, Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, you know, begins with that mm -hmm, too, reason mm -hmm. and freedom. Uh, I, I'm not a rationalist in the sense of, you know, people like Sam Harris that, you know, you talk to. So I don't think that there's reason that supersedes everything else. And by rationally, we can always arrive at the truth. I mean, Mao rationally arrived at a terrible truth. So I, I, I certainly see Yeah, well, there's always the, the problem of the axiomatic presumptions. Yeah, I mean, right? Hayek, you know, criticizes, you know, uh, rationalists that build systems of uh, authoritarianism. And I think there was a great value there. However, by reason, I refer to a specific theological branch in Islam uh, called rational theology or akl. That's the term in Arabic reason. And it goes back to a, a theological dispute in early Islam between two schools of thought. And it was on the meaning of sharia, I mean, God's, uh, God's commandments. Uh, and actually, it goes back to, th th this was a discussion on Islam, and but it goes back to Socrates and his famous Eurofro dilemma. Uh, and I think this was discussed in Christianity as well. Uh, the, the, the dilemma is this, when God has commandments, like 10 commandments, like thou shall not murder, right? Thou shall not steal. These are fundamental key values that move our civilizations go forward. But one question is this, does God say thou shall not murder because murder is inherently wrong? It does, does God teach us about this ethical value? It's out there in the world. Or... Does murder become wrong simply because God said so? So these two ways of looking into religious commandments. And in Islam, one theology is spearheaded by the Mutazila school, but also it had an impact on the Maturidi uh, theology, which is in mainstream Sunni Islam, which I sympathize with. They said the commandments of God are educating us about values, which are also there inherently out there in the world, and also knowable by reason. In other words, 
Mm -hmm. Even if there was no revelation, human could figure out that theft or murder are wrong, but because of human passions and human you know, tendency to forget, God is educating and reminding us about those values. And there are a lot of reasons in the, in the Quran to think like that. The other school, the Asharites said, no, these things are right and wrong simply because God said so. Therefore, if God said murder is good, murder would be good. So the, the commandments define everything that is ethical. And this was this is the Asharite theology. And I in my book, I show how these discussions took place and what were the nuances. Asharite theology became more influential in Sunni Islam. And I, I'm critical of that because I think if we say uh, God's commandments only have value in themselves, first of all, we are turning God into a capricious, arbitrary legislator. Right, things become right and wrong only because he says so. There are not, it's not like like he is looking into the world and seeing com and with compassion, seeing that ordinary people, I mean, innocent people, should not die. Yeah, well, so you could secularize that. You could select secularize that argument by asking yourself, as a secular person, these fundamental laws that we have, like we sh we should not murder. Do they reflect some underlying reality in some in some profound sense, or are they arbitrary constructions of a particular time and place? And it, it's a it's a it's a very difficult argument to walk through, um, because it it, it it always depends in some sense on what you're aiming at, right? If you're aiming at power and conquest, well, then maybe murder's just just what you need. But if you're aiming at peace, well, maybe that's not the right route. So exactly. And actually, I mean, the secular way of looking at this is that, for example, should governments legislate according to what they think is right and their commandment, their laws define everything? Or should there be values beyond the governments that they should honor? Right. Right. Like, well, that's a natural right argument in some sense. Right. Which exactly. is really foundational in the West and less so in the French system, I would say. Very, in very the English true. common law system. Very which, true. Which, which that's why uh, I I believe uh, the right view in Islam was the natural right argument, which what the Mutazila said and the Maturidis also in the Sunni tradition pretty much came close. The, uh, the, the other one is called divine positivism. Like God says whatever he says and we just obey it without mm -hmm. asking why and how. Mm -hmm. I mean, it got more sophisticated over time. Still, I mean, the Asharite scholars look into the purposes of God, try to figure out. So they, that allowed analogy. But ultimately, this divine command theory that God posits as he wills, legislates as he wills. And this had two consequences. One is, one means that people who don't have your religious tradition cannot have any value because all value comes from divine commandments. So people who are secular, people who are beyond... Uh, uh, oh, so yeah, you, right. You, you close yourself to the ethical reality out there in the world, all the ethical traditions and reasoning. Second, it And you deny to, an essential commonality between the tribes of mankind by exactly. doing so. And so you, you put so, yourself in a permanent state of war. Exactly. That's why I call it the loss of universalism. Because, I mean, early Muslims studied... Aristotle and his ethical philosophy, because Aristotle is an infidel from an Islamic point of view, but they saw value because they said God gave humanity an ethical intuition and reason, and reason is universal, that allowed them. So that was the universalistic path. But the other path actually closed uh, ethical thinking. That's why after that first Well, you can also see how it would foster a kind of totalitarianism, because if God's commandments are what define good and evil, but I'm interpreting them... Exactly. <laughs> then, then, then there isn't anything beyond my interpretation in some exactly. sense, as long as I'm correct. Whereas with the more universalist view, it's like, well, wait a second, there's something outside of this that I'm not intelligent enough, wise enough to understand that I have to be mindful of. So let me, let me take it in that direction for a sec. So I'll tell you something I've been thinking about. I'm writing this book now called We Who Wrestle with God. And I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to work out this, the, the, the natural right issue in relationship to free speech. And I'm trying to do that as a clinician. And so one of the things that Carl Rogers proposed, um, and he was uh, extraordinarily influenced by Protestantism. He was a seminarian. and he wanted to be an evangelist before he became a secular humanist. But Rogers observed that if you listen to people talk, if you actually listened that they would spontaneously transform themselves in a way that improved their life. And he pointed to a fundamental psychological mechanism that was driving that. And you, you could think about it in some sense as exactly the same thing 
that a parent does when that parent attends very carefully to their children. So that attention facilitates, well, I would say in some sense, the manifestation of the healing word. And I mean that as a clinician. Now, Freud, Rogers took a page from Freud because Freud also observed that if you just let people talk, but you listened, that they would unwind themselves and and straighten themselves out. And and this isn't such a preposterous suggestion unless you believe that speech is somehow divorced from neurological integrity, let's say, or social integrity. And so I think there's a very real sense in which the the reason that free speech is a natural right and maybe the, the highest of natural rights is because it is precisely reflective of the mechanism by which we move from the stagnation of our dead thoughts into a future that's what better than the dead past. And so any society that interferes with that will degenerate into a kind of totalitarian absolutism and that becomes indistinguishable from hell. It does. I mean, uh, v- very interesting. I mean, what you said reminds me of a Quranic verse. It defines believers as those people who listen to the word and, and follow the most beautiful of that. Hmm. And to be able to do that, you have to hmm. listen first, and right, you have to be able to choose that. Exactly. Uh, it's a verse in the Quran. I can't remember the number now, but I can uh, send you later the number of it. Uh, oh, that's I mean, a the- great verse. That's a great idea because, you know, it also, it also touches on the notion of a profound intuition of beauty and the idea that beauty is an intimation of what's what is divine and divine is deep and profound and necessary and i don't care if you speak about that in secular religious terms it boils down to the same thing in the final analysis and to use i i talked with one of canada's great journalists recently this man named rex murphy who's a real national treasure and He's so poetic, and he's a deep admirer of poetry, but also a very practical and down-to-earth person. But his words are beautiful, and and part of the reason they have such force is because he is in communion with that beauty, and and it shines through everything he does. So Mm -hmm. these are non-trivial realities that are being pointed to. We ignore them at our peril. Exactly. And, and uh, that is a universalistic outlook to listen to and learn from everything. And it was there right at the beginning of the Islamic civilization. And that's why Muslims built the house of wisdom in Baghdad and translated all Greek philosophy into Arabic, you know, which ultimately made its way to Europe through, through Spain, Muslim Spain. Uh, so there was this hunger to learn and appreciate, but that gradually narrowed down. And, why, and it's a fact that it has down. It has happened. Why it happened? How it happened? There are a lot of theories about it. You know, it people, happens all the time. It happens. It happens all the time. All the time. It's but, it's, it's a human listen, existential reality for that to happen. I think it will happen to any civilization at the moment they say we have reached perfection. Right? We don't need to learn anything from the outside world. And I see that sort of trend in, in, in the Western civilization. Yeah, that's the Tower of Babel. Me. That's the Tower of Babel, right? Yep. You yep, build exactly. a structure and you think it's reached the heights of God. And as soon as you think that, everyone fragments and speaks a different language and everything descends. And then the next story is the flood. And that's yep, not yep, a bloody yep, accident. Yep, 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 yep. Disintegration, uh, exactly. So it, by reason, I am referring to this view, universalistic view in early Islam, which believed that morality is universal, ethics are universal. The Quran reminds us and educates us, indicates. I mean, uh, according to Qadda Abdul Jabbar, he said, the Sharia indicates what's right and wrong. The other group said, the Sharia constitutes what is right and wrong. So if the Sharia constitutes it, you right, don't have which ethical is wisdom my beyond interpre- that. My interpretation of the Quran is well, what defines... Well, you can't have that statement without that implicit belief behind it. That's the problem with that kind of idea. It's like, well, it contains the absolute truth. Well, through whose lens? Well, mine. Well, that's pretty damn convenient for you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, and of course, thinking like that had political advantages. And actually, that's an argument I made in the book. And But that narrowed Islamic thinking. It, it also led to literalism. I mean, blind literalism, because if you don't have mm-hmm. accepted values outside of the written text, you ultimately uh, become less 
willing to interpret the text and move away a little bit from the text because you, you're bound with it too much. And, and that is that, that literalism is a burning problem, I think, in Islamic jurisprudence today. I mean, a lot of the issues about women's rights in the Muslim world come from a literalism. It's also a terrible technical problem, right, which the postmodernists grappled with and which in some sense defeated them. It's because when you read a book, you say, well, where's the truth? Is it in a single word or is it in a phrase? But the phrase is in a sentence and the sentence changes the phrase and then the sentence is in a paragraph. And then, you know, there's a really interesting image online showing the hyperlink nature of the Bible, which verses refer to which other. It looks like a kind of a rainbow. The, the Bible is densely hyperlinked because all of it refers to it, it all refers to mm -hmm. other parts of itself, mm -hmm. which is part of its depth. But what that means is that while you need the whole thing to interpret each word, you need every paragraph to interpret each sentence. And so how do you know if your interpretation exactly. is correct? Well, we, we believe what the sentence says. It's like, nope, sorry, that's just not going to do. And, and what do you mean by literally yeah. true? And are you so sure that literal truth is the, mo is the deepest form of truth? Because I don't think it is. Yep, There's yep. fictional truth, and and what that's deeper mm -hmm. than literal mm -hmm. truth, mm -hmm. obviously. So th th there's certainly, uh, and we have that in Islam, the interpretation of the Quran by the Quran. So you read it's Surah two or something, and you read fifty seven something else, and they actually explain each other. That's a very powerful approach. Uh, by literalism, I mean I can give you one example on women's rights, for example, like which is of course a burning issue in in certain parts of not all, but certain parts of the Muslim world today. You may have heard that you know Saudi authorities didn't allow women to drive cars for a mm. long time, and mm -hmm. finally when it was allowed, you know it was a big reform, and the autocratic prince who did that, you know, got a lot of brony points in the West. Although it was you know, probably a bigger reform than was even recognized. It was, it was a big reform more for them, but the people who demanded were jailed. So it's it's a it's a weird autocratic form of reform but then in now pakistan uh, i mean not Af sorry in afghanistan the taliban came to power in the 90s they were not allowing women to even walk on the street but now they will say we will allow that okay that's a progress for taliban but still women will not be able to travel alone so there is this issue of women traveling alone with a male guardian i mean it will come up in all these islamic issues i mean to conservative islamic interpretations now where does it come from well, it comes from a few hadiths that are sayings reported from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, and it's in Sahih Bukhari, one of the most authoritative, uh, the most authoritative, I think, collection of hadith sources, although I would still have some questions there on uh, on certain texts. But anyway, there you read Prophet Muhammad saying, a woman, a Muslim woman should not uh, travel alone without a mahram, that's a male guardian, uh, for longer than a, day, a distance of three days. Another version is a distance of one day. So that's there. That's the text. And classical scholars, you know, of course, they thought this was important. They calculated, actually, what's the difference of three days? Oh, 78 miles or 57 miles. There are different versions of that. So women should not be able to go. And still today, like in the UK, if you ask a fatwa from a conservative scholars, they can say, can a woman go between Birmingham and London? They can measure the distance. They say, no, no, it's not, it's not more than that distance. Well, that is a textualist reading of this. Now, another reading, which is promoted by Turkish scholars and others, I'm sure, is that, well, Prophet Muhammad said so probably because in 7th century Arabia, in the desert between Mecca and Medina, there were bad bandits attacking every unprotected woman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a woman walking alone without a male guardian, and, and women didn't carry swords by this. I mean, only men could protect women, would be attacked by these people. So he said something obviously related to that context. So his, secure, his issue was security. So security is a universal value we should care about. But if you today worry about the security of a woman driving between Mecca and Medina, I mean, uh, make sure she wears well, a seatbelt, you know, right? In, I mean, it's, a, West, it's a different... It's in the a, West, or the, in the, West yeah. the, the right of a woman to walk unaccompanied, which is obviously a right that should not be trammeled, is dependent to no small degree on the fact that she can do so in relative safety. Yep. And that's yeah, forgotten that's in some sense, right? Yep. I yep. mean, I'm not saying that that right shouldn't be promoted or doesn't exist. I'm saying that... <laughs> The, the conditions that currently prevail in the West, I mean, when I lived in Montreal, for example, anyone pretty much could go anywhere at any time of day and be safe. 
Well, that's a hell of an accomplishment that that's the case. And yeah, that yeah. is not the historical norm by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. Yeah. No, so that's for sure. I mean, uh, these religious commandments, even the Quran and Prophet Muhammad's commandments, as a Muslim, I value and respect all of them. But I understand that they were issued in a certain context. They were given. They were uttered in a certain context. And when you understand the intention behind that, you begin to understand the Sharia more intention based called makasid in Islamic tradition. So that's one way uh, of going forward in Islamic tradition that scholars are thinking. Uh, and I understand like corporal punishments. I mean, uh, that's one of the th issues that come up very much with, with Islam. I mean, uh, why, you know, why are there corporal punishments in the Quran and, and in the prophet's uh, commandments? Well, why are they in the Old Testament too, right? I mean, in all these texts, you have corporal punishments. Yes, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was a marked improvement over the previous arrangement. Exactly. And, and the Quran says there is a life for you in Qasas, which is retaliation, because in, in before the Quran, Arabs were killing each other in drones and, you know, f tribes were fighting each other. And by the way, there was no individual responsibility. So anybody from the other tribe would be given, you know, as, as, a, as a retaliation. So, but the mm -hmm. Quran brought the idea of retaliation with individual responsibility. And also it brought a few uh, corporal punishments like amputation of hands for theft, for example, which is one of the most controversial issues, I think, about Islamic law in the world today. Now, one, the literalist way to understand it is that, well, God says this, so you will implement it as, as the way it is, or, you know, you will find to, you know, find some modifications around it. But another way of looking at it is, well, there's a very good reason why I gave corporal punishments in 7th century, early 7th century Arabia, because there were no prisons. I mean, prison is an institution that is built by a state and you need to build brick walls and you need to feed somebody inside and you need to have a guard. I mean, 7th century, early 7th century Mecca and Medina weren't anything like that. People, people could only punish crime instantly or let them go. I mean, there was no idea. And that's why pre-Islamic Arabs or, or also kill them, amputated kill them or outright. killed them mm -hmm. or killed and them. And risk a feud. Exactly. And that's why pre-Islamic Arabs were also amputating hands for theft. So the Quran legislated in that context. And as a Muslim, I believe it legislated for justice. It, it legislated for the right moral purposes. But today we can punish theft with other means, such as you know prison sentences or fines, which the Ottomans already did. I mean, these modifications have already taken place to a, a certain extent in the Muslim world. I'm saying these things because, I mean, this kind of literalist understanding of Islamic texts yeah, well, we led can't to get, a lot we of We can't problems. let the literalists get away with the notion that their understanding of a sentence is right. Yeah, that just yeah, isn't exactly. how a text works. Exactly. It's way more complicated than that. And that's exactly. a big problem because yeah. it opens up the specter of infinite interpretations, yeah. which is the postmodernist yeah. dilemma. Yeah. But, but saying the text has no meaning or any meaning is no solution to that. It's like saying life has any meaning or no meaning. It's a problem, especially when they say their understanding is right. And they have the right to dominate the state and they have to impose that on everybody else. So right, that's, right, the, right. that's the key problem we have. In, in the Islamist movements. Okay. We have Let's talk about today. Mary for a minute. Oh, yeah, sure. All Go right. Back. Yeah, well, because yeah, this we issue... Of, yes, yes. Yeah, well, this issue of women's rights is definitely worth touching on. Now, so, so why do you think Mary is represented so... Uh, what would you say? Why does she have this privileged representation in the Quran? And what does that mean as far as you've been able to determine? Well, very good question. Very interesting. Uh, I should also add that the most prominent figure in the whole Quran, the most prominent human being is Moses, you know, followed by probably Mary and Abraham, and then comes Jesus Christ. You know, he's also, of course, narrated. Because the Quran is educating Prophet Muhammad about his predecessors. Like these were the pious people before you. These are the people you're your forebears. I mean, you should follow the footsteps of Moses. You should be like Jesus. And, and Mary is narrated because he's so high up and revered in the Islamic tradition. She's praised for her chastity and she's praised for uh, being brave uh, because the fact that, I mean, she was, of course, accused for committing adultery. Uh, I mean, that's what the Quran says because she had a child without a father. And and we we hear that actually we see that in the Quran and she uh, she goes and the Quranic birth story is different than the uh, Gospels in the Gospels you know Mary gives birth in uh, in in Bethlehem in a stable and you know that's the Christian imagery uh, 
The Quranic story is different. She goes and gives birth on in the wilderness out of nowhere and under a palm tree uh, because she's afraid that, you know, w- w- people will blame her and people do blame her after that. And then under this palm tree, she gives birth to Jesus and she's afraid, but God comforts her and angels speak to her. Now, I think the story there, the archetype there is a woman who will be unjustly blamed for committing adultery already she didn't do. Uh, And that's a theme that comes up also in the Quran for another woman uh, who's not named, but we know it's Aisha, Prophet Muhammad's wife. Uh, In the 24th chapter of the Quran, uh, Prophet Muhammad's wife, I mean, that's we know from post-Quranic sources, but she was left alone in the desert. A man had given her a ride with with his camel. When she came back to the city, there was a rumor that maybe something happened between them. And Prophet Muhammad was devastated. Aisha was devastated. It was a very stressful moment. And And then the Quran legislated about that, condemned the lie and the libels. And said, if you will bring any accusation against a woman of adultery, you should bring four witnesses to before you blame her. And of course, there was no witness in this case. So these two stories, I'm reading them together. Like it's about protecting women from accusation of adultery, which was, of course, the worst thing you could do to a woman, especially in the pre-modern era, even today, I think, uh, in, in, in many societies. So Mary is highlighted in that sense, which is very interesting. Uh, by the way, it's interesting, though, and sad that the Quranic injunction to protect women by asking for four witnesses was misabused in Pakistan to actually abuse women. I mean, it was, was used because when you don't understand the intention, this is what happens. There has been cases in Pakistan of a woman being raped, raped in a village, getting pregnant, and she goes to a She's taken to a, a Sharia court in the in, in the rural areas, and they ask, "Where are your four witnesses?" She says, "I don't have four witnesses, but the fact that she's pregnant proves that she committed adultery, although she's raped." And she, uh, there has been a few cases like that who were given the death penalty by the court, although it was later mm-hmm. overturned, mm-hmm. luckily, by the constitutional court. So I'm just saying this too: if you don't understand what guy, what God legislated with what intention, and if you blindly bring a a, a law into another different context without understanding the, the, understanding the difference between rape and adultery also, it can have disastrous consequences. But sorry, we digress. So Mary is highly praised. Uh, some of the things said in the Quran about Mary, you cannot find them in the Gospels. But you can find them somewhere else. You can find them in the uh, in the Gospel of James, which is an apocryphal gospel, Protevangelium of James, because there were these Eastern Gospels which told about the childhood of Mary and childhood of Jesus, which are like not Gnostic in the New Testament. Gospels. Yeah, Gnostic or other uh, mm-hmm. ones. Yeah. And so the Quran strongly resonates with that. And I think one reason. And how do you account for that historically? I mean, was there an influence of James' mode of thinking on Muhammad, or what, what do you think is happening there? Well, I wrote a book. Yeah, I know on, you did. I know yes, you yes, did. Yes, yes, No, it's a great question. I appreciate it. Well, how do I account that? I mean, Islam certainly continues Judeo-Christian traditions and very strongly resonates by a little known Christian strain known as Jewish Christianity. I mean, which which uh, comes from which considered James as their saint, you know, patron saint. Jewish Christians, which we know from the church fathers, uh, called Ebionites, people called or Nazarenes, they were practicing Jews who accepted Christ as the Messiah, but as the Jewish Messiah, not in the fully Christian sense of the term, not divine, but as Jews expe- expect the Messiah today. So they were practicing Jews who accepted Jesus, which made them unorthodox from both a Jewish point of view and also a mainstream Christian point of view. Not the wisest political move, maybe. Yeah, so that's why, I mean, they were squeezed and uh, we hear them as heresies in church fathers' writings and this, they disappeared after fourth century. But what is striking is that the, the Jesus defined by the Quran is very similar to what the Jewish Christians believed. And also the theology of Quran is very similar to this idea that you're saved by act, not just faith alone, which is, you know, a the, the mm, distinction that's a from the Holy problem. line. Yeah, and uh, I think it's more on a Jewish path, but appreciates Jesus from a more Jewish perspective. Uh, 
and it is very similar. Now, there are two ways to understand this. One is to say, well, some of these teachings made their way to Arabia and, you know, obviously influenced the birth of Islam and Prophet Muhammad might have acquired these teachings from these uh, Christian unorthodox groups. That's the historical interpretation. And, and I can understand how uh, people think like that. As a Muslim, I believe, well, this is revelation. I mean, God sent that revelation. God sent this revelation again. So I don't need to believe that Prophet Muhammad acquired that wisdom from a pre-existing community, but that's, a, that's an answer of faith. Uh, but others can, I can very easily understand that they can say these Christian teachings influenced the birth of Islam. But whatever path we take, even if we believe that there's revelation or even if we believe that there's a history, the point is our religious traditions are deeply connected and, and they are not alien. And, and there is not a Judeo-Christian tradition, but Judeo-Christo-Islamic tradition, as I said. And the moment we begin to connect them, we, will, mm -hmm. uh, lear we can learn from each other. I think Muslims can learn from Christian tradition more and Christians can learn certain things from the Islamic tradition today. Uh, and we can think of our problems as we, the monotheists, you know, we have these issues and how do we deal with them in the modern world? Uh, that's why I find intra-Christian discussions about freedom or freedom of conscience or secular state very interesting. Uh, and I think we have, we have patterns and roots in Islam which can be connected to those. Okay, I want to torch you with one more issue and, and then we You're should welcome. probably stop because I'm getting... I'm getting worn out listening and talking, so um, Sorry I might that, stop yeah. making sense. No, it's yeah. per, it's good. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So I mentioned earlier this idea that Rogers developed that was deeply influenced by his Protestantism and that had also been observed by Freud and the psychoanalysts, that merely letting people speak, but in a welcoming way, right, in, 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 a, in an attentive way, so you're providing a container for the revelation, let's say, the revelation of themselves to themselves, that that was intrinsically deeply healing. And one of the things that Jung pointed out, which I thought was staggering in its implications, was that the mythological or theological Christ was actually a symbolic representation of that process. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. so it's quite, so we imagine there's a historical figure, but there's a, there's a psychological figure, mm -hmm. that's how I would look mm -hmm. at it, but a theolo you can think about it in theological mm -hmm. terms at all. This gets complicated when, when you get into the outer reaches of thought. But then, so what I see happening was that the West organized itself, unbeknownst to itself, to some degree, under this principle that free discourse accompanied by attentive listening which is something like care for the other person's self-revelation and belief that that will make the world a better place in the mm -hmm. highest sense. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the sine qua non of, of successful therapy, in my estimation. Well, that's, that's, that's both embodied and symbolized by the figure of Christ. And you can see that as a reflection of human universalism as well. Mm -hmm. He happens to be the figure in the West when you're speaking psychologically, but it's representing something that's a lot more like John's notion of the eternal word mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. something that the Egyptians tried to represent with the figure of Horus and the Mesopotamians with the figure of Marduk and, and so forth. And it's sort of at the basis of the Campbell Jung idea of a universal mm -hmm. archetypal redemption mm -hmm. story. And so what I what I struggle with is in the Islam world, you have this contradiction in some sense, from, from my perspective as a Westerner, between the figure of Muhammad as in some ways the ultimate authority or guide or, or prophet and the figure of Christ. And I can't understand it psychologically. It's like, because I can't distinguish between the honor given Christ in Islam and the honor given Muhammad. There's a contradiction there that I can't think my way through. Uh, well, great question. Uh, I think there is no con contradiction from an Islamic point of view because Islam sees this as one big history of monotheism. So Prophet Muhammad is following the footsteps of uh, Moses or Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Noah, and Christ is put in that uh, path. So that's why Christ isn't divine, but he is he is a word from God, he's revelation. So he's actually metaphysically speaking, the statements about Jesus puts him above any other actually creature, uh besides the angels, when you look at from a Quranic point of view. But the Quran still insists that he's not divine. So and there is no polyan theology of him 
you know, being uh, dying for the sins of humanity. So there is there's mm-hmm. not that. So that's why it, 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 Christ is brought to the broader Abrahamic story, which doesn't culminate only with Christ, but continues with, with Muhammad. So that's why, I mean, Islam takes the lower Christology, I mean, if you will, mm-hmm. from, from a, a, so that's why I think it makes sense. Although uh, I think enough attention maybe has not been given in Islamic thought to the story of Christ that has narrated us to uh, us in the New Testament. Uh, in, in early Islamic history, actually, you see that Muslims were studying the Bible called Israeliyat, I mean, the Jewish and Christian sources, because the Quran refers to them. So go and learn mm-hmm, more from mm-hmm, these sources. Mm-hmm. And I think that was a valuable uh, flux of information and wisdom into Islam. Later, it was seen as, oh, no, no, we don't need them. We just need our own you know, trajectory. And so the loss of universalism was not just lo- loss of Greek philosophy, but maybe even more so uh, the, the, this, the, you know, the matrix between the Quran and Bible. That's why I'm also uh, calling on fellow Muslims to study the New Testament and learn about the mm-hmm. story of Christ. There are passages in the New Testament, especially Paulian letters, that will not go well with Muslim theology, but we can still read and learn at least the history of Christ. And that is one, uh, actually, that's why that's what brought me to uh, writing an article in the New York Times a few years ago, what Jesus can teach Muslims today. Uh, because... Uh, besides all the theological issues about his nature, like uh, that's that's a matter of theology, but Christ had a role in first century Judaism when Jews were in a crisis, like, like we Muslims today. I mean, that analogy was made by Arnold Toynbee. He said Muslims of the modern era are like first century Jews in the sense that there is a powerful civilization, Rome, that is coming on to you, and you mm-hmm. have you have Herodians who you know, ally with that, you know, become imitating of that. And you have the zealots, you know, become fanatic. And 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 it, Toynbee made an analogy, and I think that's very, uh, very apt for us. I see Christ as a third way. I mean, he was not a collaborator of Rome, but he wasn't a fanatic. He wasn't a guerrilla leader fighting uh, a, a battle against them. And, and he called mm-hmm. on his fellow Jews to rediscover their own values. Let's look at back our halakha and see the intention. Mm-hmm. And his criticism of dry literalism and sometimes arrogant piety, you know, you, you take pride, you look down upon other people saying that they are sinners, but I'm, I'm pious. They are so relevant to some of the problems we have in the Muslim world today. I mean, I yeah, see And in the Western clerics. world. In the Western world too. And I think Definitely. that's why, that's why, I mean, I, uh, as a monotheist, you know, walking on the, uh, Abrahamic path and being a Muslim, uh, Alhamdulillah, as we say, I believe the broader tradition of monotheism that includes Moses, of course, but the story of Christ in particular has a lot to teach us. And uh, Muhammad Abdu made this uh, point. I mean, he was a Muslim reformer in the uh, late 19th century, and he said, actually, Muslims believe in the second coming of Christ. I mean, it's there, in, it's an art- article of faith in Sunni Islam. He says, the second coming of Christ means. We will begin to look at the Sharia as he looked at the law, look at the intentions, you know, look at the wisdom, moral wisdom behind that, and just don't turn into a dry set of laws, which just you know implement without uh, you know thinking of the consequences. I think there is such deep wisdom there in the in the Christian tradition, which is important for us Muslims. There are a lot of I mean uh, wisdom in the Muslim tradition too. I think to share with the world, uh, but we well, have we to could figure all out... use some more wisdom, couldn't we? Yeah, I mean, one thing. I mean, like I see people becoming so obsessed with race in the Western world since I came mm-hmm. to America a few years ago. I mean, people speak about all the colors, skin colors of their, and and I understand that there's a history mm-hmm. behind that. There's a, of course, persecution and yeah, it's discrimination the Tower of, of Babel. But uh, I mean, one thing we can say proudly as Muslims is that well, we never had that Islam is a colorblind religion. And you know who was fascinated by that? Malcolm X. Uh, Mm -hmm. He was, of course, a leader in the uh, African-American community. He was, because of the persecution and discrimination, he had also a very negative view of the white people. But his life changed when he went to Mecca. And that's a very powerful story. And he saw Muslims with blue eyes and blonde hair and black skin and brown skin. And he said, they're all brothers in faith. They're not discriminating against each other. So he became post, you know, uh, racial, <laughs> uh, thanks to his exposure to that universalism uh, in Islam, which I'm proud of as a Muslim. So I think there are great th- things in our traditions to share with each other, but we have to overcome the totalitarian impulse, as you said, the coercive interpretations, the hateful interpretations. 
And uh, there's there's ground to work in every tradition. And I, I'm trying to do my uh, part as a you know Muslim living in the 21st century is, who's concerned about the future of the world and the ummah. Much appreciated. Thank I you very much this. for talking to me. Thank you very much for talking to me. This was a great conversation. And Where are you? I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. You're in Washington. Yeah, okay. at the Cato okay. Institute okay. offices. Well, and it would be nice to see you if I... I'm going to come to Washington next year, and it would be very nice to see you. Oh, inshallah, as we say, I would love to. Uh, let's break bread together and, and speak about all these great uh, issues which we should all uh, think about. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much.